right, let's read together. Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar. Now, this passage here in Ezekiel 47, and then it continues on down to uh, verse uh, 9 and 10, is symbolic of what we would call the kingdom revival. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Now, what we've been discussing for the last couple of months, the saved nations, and then we went into the elect, the two groups of people that are saved, and we've been talking about God's reason for having an elect, having a church. The church for 2,000 years has kind of been like Somebody hired you, and you got on the job, but nobody told you what to do. It was like somebody went and hired a whole bunch of people, said, I'm going to pay you well, and it's going to be nice, and all this and all that, and never told them what you're going to do. So everybody figures, yeah, well, yeah, I'm part of it. What are you going to do? I don't know. So we made up a whole bunch of stuff about mansions and in heaven and all this, and flying around golden slippers. Because we didn't know what the job was. We didn't know what the purpose of hiring us or saving us or church. It's like it didn't have any purpose. But we have named 14 purposes that God has in his church for saving us. 14 jobs, 14 things, reasons why God hired us on. And that's what we're talking about. And also we're keeping in mind that for each one of these jobs, you have to be prepared. You have to be prepared. None of them you can float in. You have to have, be made in the image of the Lord. And you have to go be like him in the way he thinks, acts, and speaks. And you have to be what? in union with him. You have to be one with him in marriage. You have to have these two things. God is working on us to do two things in us. Two things in us. He's changing us, which we all know. Anybody hasn't been through any change in the last year? Huh? <laughs> you must be on a sabbatical. You haven't been through any change in the last year. I guess all of us have been going through change. And it's stressful, isn't it? This pressure. And when uh, things hide in us, God sends the hornet after them and smokes them out. And boy, the stuff that comes out of us is interesting. But that's God. I mean, that's not bad. That's good. That's good. That's what we want. And that's where he's getting that image. He's, he's changing what, how we think, changing how we speak, changing how we act. So it's like Jesus. That we can understand. The union, it merely means that not only is he making us like him in the way we behave, but he is, he is making it so that we can't do anything without him, so that we are married to him, so we depend on him, so we don't try to do stuff ourselves. We don't try to minister by ourselves. We don't try to live by ourselves, but everything we do is in Jesus Abide in me. So there's two things. One, to be like him. And secondly, to be in union with him. Uh, as accomplished as we're going through life and the Lord is teaching us and bring us into various circumstances that change us and that press us into him. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Now, this, this preparation, which is the change in the marriage, is so that we can do these 14 jobs, these, or play these 14 roles, if you want to think of it like that. So we can do these 14 things that God has in mind. And none of them are possible unless we are in his image, you know, kind of people going around, you know, violent or swearing or, 
or uh, drunken or lying or stealing or gossiping and, and, uh, and do these four, uh, 14 things. You can't do it. We've got to be made like him. And then we have to be part of him so that everything we do is depending on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. And he does these things by distressing things that happen to us to keep pressing us into Jesus. Don't they press us into Jesus and make us pray harder? And so we're changing and being pressed into Jesus all at the same time. Now the reason for this change and this pressing into Jesus is so we can do these 14 things. And that's what we're talking about is these 14 things. And what was the first one we talked about? The bride of the lamb. And this is, some, see, these are things God wants. We don't think about that enough. But Jesus wants a bride. Jesus has set his heart on us. Jesus wants us. And so we're being brought through this change and pressed into him so that Jesus for eternity will have a helpmeet, will have a bride, and will not be alone. God said it's not good that man should be alone. So he's making a bride for his son. Does that make sense? We've covered that a lot. Then what's the second thing that we talked about? A body that the Lord, that this Messiah, this one who's to come and establish peace on the earth is not only a head, but a body. If it was to be done just by the head, it would have been done 2,000 years ago. But the Messiah that the Jews are waiting for, that the Christians are waiting for, when Christ will come and bring peace and end war, make everybody live happily, uh, and the Jews want the Messiah to come, is not just a head. The head is the Lord, the great Lord. But he, God has chosen that the head have a body. Those are two needs that God has of the 14. Those are two out of the 14, one-seventh of the whole. All right. And neither of these is possible. Neither the bride nor the body is possible unless we are in his moral image, being made like him in the image of God in the way we behave, and are depending on him and in marriage to him. It's necessary for the bride necessary for the body. Now, the third thing, this is the third one we're going to talk about, is a, ve a vehicle for the end time revival, for the kingdom, not end time, kingdom revival. A vehicle for the kingdom revival. Now, I know uh, that this is not bearing on what's happening to us on the, the uh, May the 5th, but it's coming, and it will affect the whole world, and it cannot come until there is a vehicle prepared. There must be people who carry this revival. I'm going to be talking tonight, God willing, about this revival, this kingdom revival that is coming that will, will change the whole earth, that will convert those that are left on the earth, I'll explain that in a minute, are going to be converted and ruled by the Lord's people. Okay? Now let me show you basically the scenario, what we're facing. Let's say that this horizontal line is a timeline, and we're right here. Now I'm not going to put in everything that's going to happen, but the thing that one of the things we're building up here for we'll call the the two witnesses or the latter rain revival. This is not, this revival that is coming is a church age revival. It is not a revival to bring in the whole earth like the kingdom revival. That's not what's at hand. What is at hand, and, it, and we're being prepared for it because there must, but I'm not going to talk about the preparation for the witnesses tonight some other time. That's another one of the purposes as a witness, but that's a big issue. I don't want to deal with that. 
But I'm just showing you the timeline so we can place the kingdom revival that we are talking about. This two-witness revival is a regular church age revival. It will be casting out of devils, raising the dead. It is for a witness. It will be the greatest witness that God has ever given to the earth. And in Matthew, Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to every nation for a witness. And then the end shall come. <clears throat> that revival is close. That's the latter rain revival. And as his hand and things have kind of quieted down in the churches, you can feel that tension pulling up and the prophets are beginning to speak. God is going to pour out his spirit. He is going to pour out his spirit in a way that the earth has never seen. That's the latter rain revival. It is a church age revival. After God is satisfied that all the earth has seen the power of Jesus and has heard the gospel, God is going to withdraw his spirit and then is going to come the Antichrist and the days of trouble. Now, this Antichrist government is coming together now. You can all already see it as it's coming up. And our president has gone a long way into a world, one world government. He has gone a long way toward putting the Constitution of the United Nations over the United States Constitution. This is a very real danger at this time, I understand. And unless our Congress stands up against it, the first thing you know, there will be areas of the Constitution of the United Nations that are superior to the United States Constitution which eventually will mean that uh, mili uh, the, the major military decisions and uh, legal decisions concerning uh, religious worship, for example, uh, the occupation of uh, the Holy Land is another one, will, the United States will no longer have power to make its own decisions concerning that. We are heading toward that rapidly, and that's one of the things that came out of the Gulf War, is the rising up and solidifying and, and underscoring the UN Constitution and uh, uh, the Prime Minister, what's his name, Majors of England, just made a, a statement about it that power must be given to the United Nations, it must be a supreme power. Our president is in favor of this. Russia's in, uh, Gorbachev is in favor of this. We see this already as a tremendous danger and our country seems to be largely unaware of what actually is taking place in Congress with reference to the subordinating of the American Constitution to the UN Constitution. So I don't, I don't think God's going to let it go too far because this, uh, it, it is necessary that these things happen. I'm telling you this, to accomplish God's purposes and nothing is going to stop it. It is necessary that evil come. It is necessary that offenses come and there's nothing going to stop it because it will bring God's will to pass. Our job is not to fret about the offenses. Uh, that's not our job. Our job is to find God's will for our life and do it. See? Because these things are going to happen. Okay? So this one world thing is shaping up rapidly, but before it, it takes over, there's going to be this last great witness. Then God will withdraw his spirit, <clears throat> and things will become very, very dark spiritually, very dark spiritually, and there will be great persecution. And many, many believers will be killed at this time. Many. And there will be some who will survive as a testimony on the earth until Jesus comes. But well, we are coming to a tremendously dark hour of persecution after this great latter rain revival. It's going to be the fat cows and then the skinny cows. <clears throat> then, at the time of great darkness... The, uh, the major armies of the earth, are uh, uh, the Jews will stand against this. The Jews will be the, the only major nation that will not relinquish their sovereignty, that will not agree to come under the rule of Antichrist. And as a result, he is going to get the... the they, they, they will stand in the way of world peace as Antichrist sees it. And he will gather the nations of the earth and they will go up and they will be successful in invading Israel. They will be successful 
in invading Israel. And Antichrist will take his place in the temple. There will be, that will be, then there will be tribulation on the earth. God said it will be so great that if God did not intervene, every human being on earth would die. He said there would no flesh be saved. But he said for the elect's sake, the days would be shortened. But, it, but the thing that will cause the great tribulation to take place will be when Antichrist sits in the temple of God and says, I am God, there never has been any other. I am God, the God. And when that happens, there will be trouble. And Jesus said, flee from Jerusalem. There will be trouble such as never been, has there been on the earth. And then the Lord will return. The Lord will return right here. And at the time of his coming, the revival of which we're speaking of now, the kingdom-wide, the kingdom, did I say kingdom-wide? The terms are important. The kingdom revival will take place here. And this is not a church age revival. This is a revival over the whole earth because when the Lord returns, he will destroy the wicked and then the nations of the earth will all come to be saved by the Lord. Uh, I'll show you that uh, so, because it seems like an impossible dream, but it isn't. You've seen it before. It's Isaiah 60. We sing about it. The Spirit is testifying about it in song, but it is not yet. It will be in the sequence of events as I have told you. This is the kingdom revival, Isaiah 60, that we'll be studying also in Ezekiel 47. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. See when it will happen? And gross darkness the people at the height of the darkness. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. This will happen at the same time that the Lord comes from heaven. He will come from heaven and shine upon the people of the earth at the same time. So there's a great light in heaven and on earth at the same time. In the days of Noah, the fountains of the deep were opened up and the water came from below and then it came from above. And that's the, speaking of the coming of the Lord, the glory will come from beneath and then from above. And he said, and the nation shall come to your light. See, that's not... That, do you see the difference between that and a church age revival? In a church age revival, you go through the land and you say, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. You cast out devils, you raise the dead, heal the sick, and people believe or they don't, and you go on to another town. Do you see? That's the latter rain revival. Do you see that? This is not a church age revival in Isaiah 60. This is where the whole nations come. I mean, the devil is out of the earth, the demons are out of the earth, and the whole earth comes under the glory of God. That's the kingdom revival. And the reason we're studying it tonight is because it's one of these 14 purposes of God is to have a vehicle. If there, were, if the, if the, if there was not a part of the church that was prepared to receive these people, there would be no purpose in doing it. And you can't prepare a vehicle for this revival in a, in a moment. All right, let me show you. Let's say that tomorrow night was the time of this kingdom revival. Not, not the, not the two-witness revival that's coming first, but this kingdom revival, this massive thing. Let's say that it happened tonight and all the nations of the earth came to the church. What would happen? <coughs> sure, what would the church attempt to do? Organize it. Organize it. And what would happen to the leaders of the church? Huh? They'd all fight. I was just heard the other day, I won't say where, but it, it was not in California, of a large church. Something like it was a it was an evangelical type church. And they and it was really booming and bustling. They got up to I think uh fifteen thousand members. Well, today it's going all over the place because there was a power struggle in the leadership and just bust, bust it wide open. So, if a kingdom-wide revival, if this uh, kingdom revival were to come tomorrow night, 
it would result in absolute chaos. What do you think the Mormons would do? What do you think the Jehovah's Witness would do? What do you think the Charismatics would do? What do you think the Seventh-day Adventists would do? What would the Baptists do? Do you think they're going to say, oh, this is wonderful, you know, everybody's being saved? They'd be saying, well, you come over here. If you're not baptized into the Southern Baptist Church, you're going to hell. So they teach. If you're not become a member of the Catholic Church, you're not a part of the church. What would the Catholics do? So obvious, So the reason I'm talking about it now is because God now is preparing people intellectually so we understand what's happening to us and taking out of us a horrible thing. I'm, I'm writing a book now, and I'm very hot on this subject of will and uh, personal ambition. And the name of the book is The Mountains of Bashan. And uh, <coughs> I didn't intend to write any more books, I'll tell you. But uh, I got to get this finished, God willing. Because it, it, it is the major, one of the major problems of the world from the time of Cain and Abel has been men, the mountains leaping, men seeking what only God will appoint. And whether you're talking about the, the prophets in the king's courts prophesying lies, or whether you're talking about Korah, whether you're talking about Absalom, or whether you're talking about uh, the Judaizers that withstood Paul, or the Pharisees and Sadducees that withstood Jesus, or whether you're talking about Cain and Abel, the whole record of mankind is ambitious people trying to take the kingdom by violence. And it's all the same in the secular and the sacred realms because, incidentally, kids, kids, you don't mind that, do you? There is no difference between the sacred and the secular. This is the craziest thing. Man is a material, spiritual being. And we've got the asinine position in our government of trying to separate the st uh, state from the church. You can't, you can't do that. The people don't divide up that way into the sacred and the secular. They divide up into him who has eternal life and, and uh, he who has eternal life and he who does not. But sacred and secular, you, you get in a Muslim government, how do you divide the sacred and the secular? There's no such division. All men everywhere are tempted with the same things, which is uh, leaping, trying to gain the kingdom by violence. All men everywhere are doing this. And I would say 90% of church work is done by blindness because when the mountains of Bashan leap, it causes blindness. As in the case of Korah, who thought that he could take over Moses and Aaron's place. God had never talked to him. I mean, it's a crazy. What was he going to do when he got there? What was Absalom going to do as king of Israel? He'd never been called out and anointed. He, he wasn't the sweet psalmist of Israel. God hadn't given him the keys. What was he going to do when he had tricked and schemed and outwitted David? What was he going to do with it? It's the whole record. What would the Judaizers have done with the gospel? What would the Pharisees and the Sadducees have done for eternal life? It's the whole record of man. God chooses a man to do something and then other men see it and imitate it. They're imitators and usurpers. And that's the whole history of man. It happened in the beginning with Cain and Abel. Abel's response should have been, God, I'm sorry, I, I, show me how to please you. I repent and come to God in love and God would have shown him. Instead, Bashan started leaping. I'll get him, you know, he'll not do this again, kill him. So that's a whole history of man. It's a canvas, so big. I, I, Audrey is praying for me this morning because my brain is swimming. It's, it's an enormous, it, it is the story of man on the earth. It's a story of usurpation and trickery and scheming. And, it, and it's especially among able and gifted people that it operates. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were princes of renown. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the high members of their, of their culture. Absalom was a son of the king. These are the people that get infected with ambition. It's gifted people, and they become imitators and usurpers. And unless God grants them repentance, their end is like the end of Absalom. Their end is like the end of Korah. And they can't see it. It creates blindness. What they see is what God has done for someone, but they don't realize you can't imitate that. God does not want imitators. Listen, don't imitate anybody. God has something special for you. 
It may be a very lowly place. It may be a very exalted place. It doesn't matter. You don't find happiness. See, men kid themselves. They think, oh, if I could be like him, if I could have what he has or what she has, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't be because you couldn't handle it because God hasn't given it to you. But so life goes on. And this is the core of it. And I'm sure it's true in, in uh, Earl's line of work and all of your line of work. You find people are striving by putting other men down and tricking and jockeying for position. But God gave us the example in Jesus, and Jesus never, never sought to grasp power or authority or anything. He committed himself to God, and until self-seeking men put him to death to remove him, and what did God do? He made him Lord of all. I've been through this, you see, because this has happened to me on several occasions. Till finally one time, a group of men had managed to push me off the scene, and, and I... And I was just, I was resting and thinking about this, the things that they had said. And I thought, Lord, I'm not going to resist them. Is it possible that they can take away from me what you have given me? Can they, can they by striving and trickery and conniving and politicking among themselves, can they really bump me? Can they do it, Lord? Well, I don't, I'm not going to fight against it. Uh, and I'm not going to worry about it. But are they able to do that, really? <laughs> I guess I was laughable to God. But he caused something to happen within a very few minutes that showed me that there was nothing that they could do. What God had given me was mine, and no one could usurp it. No one can usurp it. They tried. But uh, when we came to this church... Uh, and I heard about the tremendous progress that was being made at North County Christian Center, I think was the name of it at the time. It was a big charismatic church. I had no idea it was there. And, and I, when I heard about it, and I heard of how it was growing and everything, and I, I said, Lord, why did you send me to a place where you've already got a wonderful charismatic church going? Why did you do that? There's so many areas that have no charismatic church. Why did you send me here? And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. That church doesn't even exist anymore. Jesus did not grasp anything. He did not politic. He did not scheme. He had no hidden agendas. He committed himself to God. And he was murdered by men, by mountains of Bashan, who were envious, who wanted the kingdom. The kingdom suffers violence. The violent take it by force. Now God has given him everything. Everything. They couldn't take anything from him. Anything. That is one of the greatest lessons that any person, human being, saved or unsaved, can ever learn in this world is not to promote yourself. You know, you remember the psalm says, promotion comes neither from the east nor from the west. It is God who puts up one, puts down another. It says, why do you, uh, what is, I'm paraphrasing, why do you spend sleepless nights? He gives his beloved sleep. Except the Lord build the city, they labor in vain that build it. And you know, the whole record of mankind on the earth from the days of Cain and Abel has been men striving to get that by imitating and usurping rather than to going to God and being content with the Lord. And when we can get to the place where we refuse to lift up our hand, we refuse to politic, we refuse to scheme, we refuse to work the moves, we will enter the rest of God. It's a tremendous lesson. And it's equally true among the saved and the unsaved. There are no secular and sacred divisions in kingdoms. Kingdoms are the same, whether they're secular or sacred, so-called. The dynamics are the same. And the results are the same. 
God, who at sundry times and time past spoken to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us. The, that's true salvation. God speaks. But for every man to whom God speaks, as 500 rise up and want it. They imitate it. They say, he can do it. I can do it too. God saves his people from Bashan. And the yokes of Bashan, according to Isaiah 2, will be cast down in the day of the Lord. The mountains of Bashan. Why leap ye, you mountains? They're rugged mountains. They're majestic mountains on the east of Jordan. In the land of Og, and Og was of the Rephaim. The land of Og was the land of the Rephaim, the land of the giants. His bed was 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. Bashan stands for that which is exalted in the flesh. Now today, the Christian church, for the most part, in my opinion, however humble or proud it may be, is blind. They're blind leading the blind. And that's why we get false doctrine, is because people are not hearing from God. They are trying to be ministers. They the religious men seek gospel work. They, they're drawn to it. They'd rather hear themselves preach than get $100. They're just religious men. And Satan moves quickly into that. He moves quickly into that. Just as he moved into Judas. Just as he moved into uh, Cain. See, sin crouches at the door. Because he's religious. Because, see, he's the first usurper. He's the first imitator. Five times. Audrey, I told you three times this morning, the next verse added two more. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend into the heavens. I will ascend above the clouds. I will sit in the sides of the north. After God had already appointed a king in Zion in the sides of the north, I will sit on the mount of the great. I will, I will, I will, I will. The great imitator, the great usurper. So any man that is religiously ambitious is an open target for Satan, and Satan enters in and deceives him, and he begins to politic and push and shove to make a name for himself. That's true in the business world. It's true in the churches. The dynamics are the same. The results are the same. But a God has a proper gift and a proper role for every man on this earth, and the idea is to trust God, to relax, let him do it, and to imitate no one. How does that sound to you? It's not easy. It's not easy to take your hands off and say, well, Lord, if they're going to push me out, they're going to push me out of it. That's up to you if they can do it. And not scheme and not push and not politic. Take faith in God. Hallelujah. All right, now, God wants a vehicle for this end-time revival. And in order to get a vehicle, he must prepare people who are without this self-centered business, but who have been purged by the Lord, have been prepared by the Lord, are in union with Jesus, and are morally <coughs> pure in Jesus by His grace, and they will be ready to receive the nations. The nations belong to God. He loves them. He died for them. And he is not going to give it to a self-seeking church. So this kingdom revival is not possible unless the church is changed. And the change must begin now. Does that make sense to you? That's why tonight we're preaching about something that's not happening in your house on May 5th, because in addition to our personal problems, we're, we're going to have to build with one hand and fight with the other. We've got to keep our households going with one hand, and we've got to prepare for God's great move on the other. His third purpose Guys, they're taking notes. His third, first the bride, second the body, third a vehicle for the kingdom revival. Now, we saw it in Isaiah 60. The nation shall come. Look up your eyes round about. This is a worldwide, earthwide revival. The wicked nations having been destroyed when they went against Jerusalem, the Lord destroyed them with his return, and now his glory is upon his prepared saints. They are prepared to bring in the harvest of of the world. You see that? They're prepared to bring in the harvest of the world. And if you look at Isaiah 60, these people don't look up, they don't look at the Lord. 
They don't look at the Lord. They don't see the Lord at all. Guess who they see? The Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, not to the Lord, to the prepared vehicle, the people who will bring the glory of God to the earth. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, I tell you, oh, man, it boggles the mind. All right, now, now I want to show you a type in the tabernacle of the congregation. And that is found in Exodus, and we're going to go back to Ezekiel, God willing, because that's where the main thing is. But Exodus 26, verse 6. Is anybody in the house able to find Exodus? Exodus 26, verse 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Exodus. All right. Exodus 26, verse 6. <clears throat> now, what this is talking about, hey, what happened to the tabernacle? I mean, I'm away for one Sunday. I'm, people move the chairs, people preach Lutheran theology, and they remove the tabernacle. I, I was all set. I was going to show you while I have to do it, some makeshift thing here. All right, well, you'll have to remember, well, in fact, I suggested to Doug that he move it over there where he's teaching and he they were they were already thinking of it anyway. All right, now the tabernacle had the building. I'm just gonna refer to the building here. And it was divided into the uh, holy place. And then this is the most holy, this uh, smaller room. This was actually a cube. It doesn't show it here, but it's actually it's, uh, three dimensions were all the same, 15 feet cube. All right, the holy place, here, dividing the two is what? The veil. All right, now, this veil represents, the, the holy place was 2,000 cubic cubits, which represents the 2,000 years of the church age. The most holy place was 1,000 cubic cubits. It was 10 by 10 by 10. 10 cubits by 10, if that's 15 feet. But it was 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits. 1,000 cubic cubits. This was 10 by 10 by 20. 2,000 cubic cubits. This was 1,000 cubic cubits. So this is the church age, this is the kingdom age. It's separated by the veil. Now the hangings on the tabernacle, the curtains that covered it, were joined together here with what the King James calls tatches, or they were actually clasps that, that, uh, that uh, held the curtains together so that they were one curtain or one covering. There, there were clasps here over the veil, and that's what this passage is talking about. And you notice that it says in Exodus 26, verse 6, it says, Thou shalt make 50 tatches, now that's clasps or rings, of gold, and couple the curtains together with the tatches, and it shall be one tabernacle. Now, they were coupled together here, right here, at where you change from the church age to the kingdom age, with 50, 50 gold clasps. You know what a clasp is or a ring? They were clasped together. That there was a curtain and then a curtain and they were classed together to make one curtain or one tabernacle. All right, now, what does gold represent in the Bible? Divinity. What does 50 represent? Pentecost. The word penta means 50. So what it's telling us is that when the one age ends and the other age begins, there will be an outpouring of divinity on the earth. That's the kingdom of Revival. It's not the latter rain witness. It's the kingdom revival of Isaiah 60. Okay? But that isn't the end of it. In Exodus 26, verse 11. And thou shalt make 50 tatches or clasps or rings of brass. Now, scholars believe this was bronze. Not actually brass, probably, but bronze. 
Now, what does bronze represent in the Bible? Judgment. Judgment. That which can withstand fire. Gold cannot withstand fire. If you want to make a fireproof door, well, Asley will not burn, cover it with uh, a thin layer of bronze. It will not burn. They did that in England in World War II. It would not. If you would uh, coat both sides of a wooden door with a thin layer of bronze, forget it. It will never burn. It will never burn. And so it represents judgment, that which can stand the fire of God. And it was 50 of those. So what does that tell us? There will be an outpouring of judgment. So when we pass from the church age into the kingdom age, which and we must be right about here now. I mean, we're just about ready to go over. There will be the great, well, at the time of crossing, bringing us into the new age, the kingdom age, will be a tremendous outpouring of God's person. He shall come up to us as the rain in a tremendous outpouring of judgment which will destroy Satan from the earth. Now, the judges is one of the 14 purposes, and I'm not going to talk about it tonight. I'm not going to talk about the 50 bronze we're talking about is the 50 gold, the people that will be prepared by the Lord to receive the fullness of God's glory so that their light lightens the whole earth and all the nations come to them to be saved and to be received of the Lord. And God has to prepare us for that tremendous thing. The churches today, are they would just try to put the, stuff them in their little cracker box. They'd all be competing you know, the, the Mormons would be there passing out their stuff and the Jehovah's Witnesses would be passing out their stuff and all the different groups would be passing out their stuff and trying to get disciples. God's going to have a people to receive them in which none of this is present, none at all. People that love the Lord and are moved by Him. And that's where you and I come in. Praise the Lord. We're supposed to be being made free from this stuff, from sin, from self-seeking, from all the things that are not of the Lord. That's one of his great purposes. Uh, vehicles for the kingdom revival. All right, now we go to Ezekiel 47. We see a picture of this revival as clear as anything could be. Um, the man, is, is Ezekiel 47, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. We're coming back now to the beginning, to a new beginning. This is a new beginning now, a new lease on life. And, and uh, I saw water, that's the Holy Spirit coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. God's always moving toward the east. The tabernacle was always moving toward the east. God faced the east, the rising of the sun. This is talking about the day of the Lord. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. These are the waters of the Holy Spirit flowing out from the Lord. South usually indicates that it's a blessing, whereas the north is, speaks of judgment. Um, he then brought me out through the north gate. That's where the judgment is, where the severity is, and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. We're talking now and symbolically about the coming of the Lord. And the water was flowing from the south side. And the man went eastward. Every outpouring of God's Spirit has been a south, it has been a blessing. If you study the uh, histories of revivals, it always comes as a southern, uh, a south, a, a blessing. God's revivals come as tremendous joy and peace, and glory, and blessing, and healing, and every other wonderful thing. And the man went eastward. He's moving now toward the coming of the Lord. We're hasting under the coming of the Lord. And God wants us to always have that, and not forget that we are strangers and pilgrims. How many know it's easy to forget that you're a stranger and a pilgrim? Huh? We get so involved because of the economic pressure. And the things that are around us, family pressures, medical expenses, every kind of bill and problem you can imagine. And we forget that we're strangers and pilgrims. This is not. I mean, this is. This is not what we're trying to make our home. 
Okay, we're looking for these. We have to be reminded of that, remind ourselves of it. And he had a measuring line in his hand. And God is continually looking, measuring. Why is he measuring? Why? Why is God always measuring and judging? Because he has purposes that cannot be accomplished until it required, the required dimensions are met. See, he was talking about measuring or judging the elect. And the elect have never been ready for God's purposes, for the bride, for the body, for the vehicle, for the judges, and all the other purposes of God. He's measuring to see how close the church is to fulfilling his purposes, getting ready to fulfill his purposes. The reason God has allowed all this agony to go on for 2,000 years is because the church isn't ready. It has taken all this to, to lay a foundation, but it's going to move quickly in the days in which we are living. It's going to move quickly in these days. Boy, don't get your mind on the world today. Things are popping in the spirit realm. He had a measure line. He's going to judge now and see where we are. He measured off a thousand cubits. He then led me through the water that was ankle deep. And that's speaking about basic salvation. He had brought the church to a basic position in himself. They had just begun to get going. Now, this there are no position here to serve as the bride of the Lord without spot or wrinkle. There are no position here to serve as a vehicle for the kingdom revival. But they have gotten into the water of God. Okay? Not ready yet, but this is the status where they are. And he then led me through water. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He moved the church further into Pentecost. This is speaking of the knee deep is Pentecost. The water has more control over the person. He's measuring how close. Well, what's the situation? Don't you think that God wants these things? His vehicle, the bride, the body, the judges. Put yourself in God's place. He has to look down here on the earth and see the abortion going on and all the agony going on. And we can yell and fret ourselves all we want to. It isn't going to change. The forces of evil are so great. The things are not going to change no matter who's president. They're going to continue to get worse. Because this, it's the elect, a prepared elect are the only solution, the only solution to the problems of the world. Do you see it? You got another solution in mind? Do you see any problems in the paper today? Did you ever sit down and think about how if you were president, or if you were governor, or if you were mayor, what you would have done about last week's riot, what would you have done? If you were President Bush, what would you have done? Don't you know there's 15 million newspaper commentators, each one of them knows what he would have done. <laughs> Don't you realize any move that he made, he, he, it was impossible? Let's say that he, he, he'd flown right out there in the fastest jet the army had, landed in the street, took command of the police, and said, anybody, any right, he announced a curfew, said, any rider on the street, shoot him in the foot. Shoot him in the foot. Or shoot him with a, with a tranquilizer pellet. Put him out and we'll, you know, haul him off in the paddy wagon. It, it will stop the riot cold. The reason it went on is because there was no show of resistance. What would have happened? People would have complained about brutality. Of course. Of course. Of course. The whole black community would have been uh, absolutely against him. They said, what are you doing? This was an unjust decision. This was your response. If he stays back and lets them wreck the neighborhood, what's the response of the black community? Yeah, why didn't you get here sooner? Uh, some of them were sweeping up the street and they said, the National Guard said, the National Guard, where are you? See? Just try to think of how he could have solved this. And it's easy for us to sit back and then we do this, that, or the next, teach the kids to play basketball or do something. But we don't know the pressures all these things combined and people in the background playing politics and using it for their own political advancement and all these other things going on and, and, and uh, mob leaders who are just looking for a chance for insurrection and testing their strength so that when the earthquake comes, they'll be organized, they can go out and really do a number. This is in the wings, you know. This is being prepared because the civilian population is losing control. The government doesn't have a will to rule. And so the gangs are planning. 
And when the big shaker comes, they're ready to move out in a systematic way and make themselves wealthy. They know what they're doing. Well, yes, that's a naive citizenry. So all these forces are operating that people don't talk about, maybe don't know about. There's no solution. If you, put, if you pump $5 million in there in colleges, colleges are the source of stealing, booze, alcohol, feminism, and, and atheism, and Eastern religion, and everything else. That's, the, that's what colleges bring. So education is it. Libraries, that isn't going to do it. Playgrounds are filled at night with uh, the homeless and drug dealers. Hey, there is a solution. Jesus. Amen. And he's the only solution. He's the only solution. I took, I was looking at the paper. I looked at the faces of the rioters. They were about as concerned about Rodney King as they were about, you know, Lad of Sunnybank. They were having a blast and getting rich doing it. But I looked at the faces of the black worshipers in St. Stephen's Church, and they were a classy-looking group of fine people. I mean, they were solid citizens, nice-looking, intelligent people in there worshiping God and distressed over this situation. That's what Jesus can do. That's what Jesus can do, and no one else can do it. And so when we say that what God is preparing you to put an end to all of this, you can imagine the desire that God has for us that we don't spend all our strength and time trying to do our own number, but find out what God wants and get with the program because it's something that God wants. We will profit, but God wants it for the sake of the nations. And there is no solution except you and me. That's, that's all there is. And he's preparing us because we must be prepared to meet the needs of the world. God wants to put an end to abortion, perversion, pornography, riots, murder, rape, mugging. God wants an end to that thing. But he's going to do it the only way it can be done. Through Jesus, through an obedient church that is not spastic. That is, if you get a body that doesn't control, it's not controlled by the head, it's spastic. And the whole church for 2,000 years is absolutely spastic. The, the head gives directions and the body's all over the place. That's where the church has been for 2,000 years. The body doesn't uh, respond to the head. The body does its own thing. The head can send any kind of signals at once. You know, it says go forward, the body goes backward. Lift your right arm, the church lifts its left arm because it's controlled within itself. So it's useless. Useless. Until, until God's people, I don't know what it's going to take, get rid of the mountains of Bashan, and begin to do the Lord's will. So he has him here to the knees. He measured off another thousand. Pentecost is not the end, thank God. That's hard for people to understand when they've been in Pentecost. And the water was up to the waist. Now here, here, is, a, here is, is getting serious, because this is where the strength of man is. It's where his fruitfulness is. This is where his dominion is, his strength. Everything about the man is up here now and it's controlling him. This is a death to our own personal drives and strength and ambition. And this is where God is bringing us now. This is where God is bringing us now. But it wasn't the end. He measured off another thousand. The death to self that we've been preaching is not the end. It's not the end. It becomes a river. When we, having gained this redemption, decide that we're going to cast ourselves into God, we come up this far because we have some kind of a spark that drives us on to attain glory, to attain the kingdom, to do God's will. It's got to get beyond that. It's got to get to the place where we just want to be cast adrift in God. We get into a river that we can't pass over. At least in the water up to the waist, we can still churn around. Now it's something that carries us. The life of God carries us. Now, what's it going to take to get you and me to the place where in waters to swim in? It's going to take so much pressure that we no longer are able to control 
ourselves at all, but where we have to be saying all the time, God, if you don't help me, I'm not going to make it. God, if you don't help me, I'm not going to make it. And as we keep being brought into that place, cast upon the bosom of God in him, we're getting ready now to be a vehicle for the kingdom revival. We're getting into the place now where God can use us for what he has in mind for the world, which is to fill the whole earth with his glory. And so <clears throat> then we find in uh, no one could cross this. No one can handle it. It's beyond you, just beyond you. It's God, 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 and there's no human instrumentality. Then in verse 6, he asked me, Son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. Now you are of use to God and of use to man. You pass through these waters. You've been judged and judged and judged. And now you're getting ready to be used of the Lord in his 14 purposes. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. These were people who had been through these crossings. These are trees of life. God is making us trees of life. Remember the first psalm. You should be as a tree of life. God is making us trees of life. Why is he making us trees of life? The world is dead. The world is dead. Do you realize that? The people all around us are dead. They're alive. They're, du they're dust, breathing dust. They have nothing of substance in them. It's a house of cards. Dust they are, and unto dust they shall return. What we have is eternal. It's eternal life. It's solid. It's tangible. It's something there that gives us a face and makes us real. And they have nothing. They have nothing. They put on a good show, but it's just like a flower in the field. It's a parade today, tomorrow it's cattle food. That's the way human beings are without eternal life. All mankind is divided, not into the sacred and the secular, but those who have eternal life and those who are just breathing dust. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region. And it goes down into the Arabah, that is down into the, into the desert of mankind, where it empties into the sea. Down, God wants his spirit to go out to all the peoples of the earth. Not a church revival somewhere, but to all people. All people. God so loved the world. When it empties into the sea, the water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. This is talking about human beings, not about fish in the sea, about human beings. This is the kingdom revival, the worldwide revival of Isaiah 60. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Now, it's hard for us to picture a world in which everybody is saved. But that is what the Bible promises. The wicked nations will be killed when the Lord returns because they've gone up against Jerusalem. And after that, God's glory will come upon the people living here, the, the Christians, the saints, in such glory and such majesty that all the nations of the earth that are left from Armageddon will be converted to the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So be patient. I know God is dealing hard with us. He's playing hardball with us. Things we don't like are happening to us. And they're causing us to dig down and to really fight to keep our feet under us, aren't they? We really have to fight. We never thought we would face such things or make such decisions. But we keep going. We keep going. And the reason is because God has in mind to use us as vehicles for the kingdom revival. Praise the Lord. Shall we stand? <clears throat>